Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to start our afternoon panel sessions. And I'm Carol Werner. I'm the director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And um, I'm on the steering committee for the Sustainable Energy Coalition. And we are very, very glad to have everybody here today and to have so many wonderful exhibitors here today. And we're going to be hearing from some of them on this panel this afternoon. Uh, and the, our upcoming panel are all people that I've worked with for a long time, some for a very long time, particularly the, that guy on the end of the table there. Um, and, uh, and I think what's really, really exciting in terms of this first panel, which it's really talking about sustainable energy and green jobs. And what, what all does that mean? What are we seeing in these industries? And I think the really exciting thing is that there are enormous opportunities. There's also a lot of growth that's already occurring, but it is only the tip of the iceberg in terms of what really can occur in these industries, particularly if we start to really get our policy frame really lined up so that there is market certainty and that there is some consistency with regard to policy that really allows these uh, industries to really flourish. And part of that is also to make sure that we are um, uh, basically uh, not subsidizing the things that are creating problems, but indeed really trying to focus our attention on those things, as Matt Rogers was saying, that are really transforming our economy and can create a much better, healthier, and more competitive America for this century. So our first speaker for this panel is Carl Gaywell, who is the Executive Director for the Geothermal Energy Association. And of course, they just held uh, um, wonderful um, uh, conference uh, on Friday uh, down at the Reagan Center and lots and lots of terrific uh, technologies and people doing wonderful things uh, and folks from around the world who were there. And so, Carl, it is a great pleasure to have you here today. Hi. Um, I'm not going to uh, – it is all relative. How much time do I have? Three hours? Oh, damn. Um, it's always interesting talking about energy, green jobs. And it's interesting because <laughs> there's a disconnect. I think that a lot of people think of green energy, new technologies, and new jobs, and they think of laboratories and NREL and, you know, people running around with uh, pocket protectors. Uh, and frankly, what they don't think about, but they can understand, is when you say, well, what kind of jobs are involved in building a highway? Because energy, just like highway, is infrastructure. Much of what we do is going to be very comparable. And if those who work on the Hill have ever worked on the highway bill, you know how many jobs are involved in the highway bill. But the thing is, they wear hats like this. They don't wear white lab coats. And that's what you mostly find is going to happen in this green economy. You're going to see new high-tech jobs. You're going to see manufacturing jobs. But you're going to see a lot of people wearing these, too. And it's infrastructure that you're building. When you look outside and see that road, you can think of the jobs that go in it. You can understand what went into the interstate highway system. Our energy system is built the same way. And in fact, it's hard to understand even to the people in the business. Uh, I, very early on in my career at Geothermal, we had the almost humorous occasion of watching the president of one major geothermal company, in fact, the largest producer in the country, that also produces a whole lot of natural gas power. And he was speaking at the major geothermal conference in California. And he was talking about his company, and he was showing his slides saying, here's all the power we produce, here's how much emissions we do, and here are all the people we employ. And he stopped in his presentation. He looked at the chart again. And he looked at the front row where all of his staff was sitting, and he goes, why do we employ all these people? Our gas plants don't employ that many people. I want to report on this tomorrow in front of several hundred people. But the fact is, is that he does. And he does because that geothermal power plant requires a lot of jobs. And the way to think about that is it's the oil field, it's the pipeline, and it's the power plant all in one place. 
I mean, geothermal power plants are the only place that you have full-time geologists on staff. But you also have to deal with pumps. You've got to deal with the lines coming through. And in fact, if you add all that together, you get a better snapshot of what, what you're going to be doing in terms of the jobs that you're going to be creating in these sites. But the other thing is, is that we're trading off. We're trading off capital for fuel. You're building more wells, more power plants. You're spending money to build that capital investment because you're avoiding the fossil fuel costs. And when you do that, Almost all of those activities, again, translate into jobs. They start with the front end, drilling. Half of the cost of a geothermal project is at the subsurface. You have to drill a well. Well, the American Petroleum Institute will point out an average well is going to employ anywhere from 120 to 150 people. If we have 188 geothermal projects in the United States today, which we have, and they're all drilling wells this summer, you're talking about 188 times 150 jobs just running those drilling rigs, supplying them with mud, supplying them with roads, supplying them with everything else they need. That's a substantial amount of employment, again, of people wearing hats like this and people who aren't coming in from someplace else but are coming from the neighborhoods that you're working in. That's the other thing you find out with most of these projects. They're hiring people locally. They're hiring people locally because that's the type of work that's generally involved in it. But you're also going to see the second stage. You've got the drilling rigs, and then you've got plant construction. What's a plant construction? It's buildings. It's fences. It's roadworks. Again, it's mostly people with hats like this. When you look at the numbers, and you can walk out. I won't bore you with the details of the thousands of jobs, tens of thousands of jobs available. What you'll find is that construction and manufacturing are the two biggest winners. That's where the big payoff is in terms of jobs in at least geothermal technologies, where we might employ 10,000 people or 20,000 people in some plants. Those same plants might take 100,000 or 150,000 people to build in terms of the construction crews, the drilling crews, and the manufacturing crews that go into it. And unfortunately, we use a lot of that stuff. Uh, I was told by a senior engineer at a, one of the engineering firms who builds geothermal plants, he says geothermal power plants probably use more steel than any other power plant built, that he builds. And he said if you take, especially the air-cooled plants like at Mammoth, and unravel the radiator system that cools the plant, he says that plant would stretch around the Earth's equator. So that steel is not normal steel. It's not running to me. It's also high specialty steel most of which, in fact, almost all the high specialty grades that we buy are made in the United States, particularly in Pennsylvania, not quite California or Utah where we're building the plants. So you, you've got a whole series of drillers, plant manufacturers, equipment you're going to put in that plant, electronics. That's probably the second biggest part of the plant that you build is all the electronic controllers, monitors, instruments, wires. And you've got a lot of electricians who, again, wear hats like this. And then the last thing you've got is turbines. Now, probably the one area where the U.S. used to lead was turbine manufacturers. A little, little company called GE used to be the big geothermal turbine manufacturer until it decided it had invented, with government support, a natural gas turbine system that was really good, and their natural gas turbines are really good. Uh, it decided the geothermal business was too small. A couple of comp companies from, let's say, not the United States got into the turbine business and pretty much captured our market until recently. Just in the last couple of years, we've had, we've had over five or six, depending on whether you want to add one that's just shifted over, new turbine manufacturers in the United States that have started here, including United Technologies. You've probably seen their small geothermal units they put at Chena Hot Springs. They did it at the thermal plant in, in Utah. Those are built on an assembly line in North Carolina. We've also had new companies like Moffey Trench, California. They built two of the plants in Nevada. Those plants, the power turbines were built in California. Electrotherm out of Nevada, doing a number of oil and gas co-production turbines. GDA, Geothermal Development Association, a small business in Reno, Nevada, will open this, uh, I think this month, this coming month, an assembly plant in Reno, Nevada for geothermal turbines that it will be selling outside the United States. And then we've, we, we've got uh, a number of other companies like uh, that the Turbine Air Systems, so I didn't mention Turbine Air Systems is in Houston, Texas, also selling small binary power systems. So from the drilling to the plant construction to the electronics in the plant to the turbine itself, 
you're adding jobs in manufacturing plants. The GDA said to me their suppliers involve 26 different states in terms of the pieces and the products that come into one of their turbines. And they just, the last one they just sold to Ethiopia. Um, so you're seeing uh, job multipliers, which are dramatic, and that cost money. So the bad news is, so, uh, Mike Andrews is in the back of the room who now works for us. Mike, you know, the thing is the companies hate it when you talk about the fact they employ so many people because of the big payrolls. A lot of the companies don't like to tell you that geothermal plants cost three times as much as a natural gas plant, because they do. We're paying that capital investment up front because we're not going to pay the fuel cost down the road. But every dollar of that capital investment goes into a job, and it goes into a job that's here in America. Many of the, the, the power plant jobs, the vast majority of them are permanent jobs, full-time jobs. They're often in rural areas. They bring benefits to the economy. And this ties into the rest of the economy in one simple way. Of all people, Ronald Reagan, in his first budget, in the budget appendix document, had an appendix that looked at where pollution came from in the United States. And the first Reagan budget concluded that a majority of all pollution in the United States is related to energy production, development, and use. So if we clean up energy production, we're cleaning up our economy across the board. So green power translates into a clean economy, and it also generates jobs in the United States, and jobs that, frankly, you'll see this summer. I was uh, asked by the Las Vegas Sun what the status is in Nevada, and I said, we, will, we put six power plants online last year, and in four different states, you will see three times or four times as many people at work this summer, drilling rigs, building plants in about eight different states in the western United States. And again, they're going to be wearing hats like this. So thank you very much. Next, we will hear from another uh, wonderful colleague, uh, Linda church Chachi who is the executive director of the National Hydropower Association. And I think that we are really seeing kind of a renaissance with regard to hydro in terms of, again, so many opportunities that have been just there that we had not really looked at. And now is the time to really be exploring all of those. And I think the other piece that is so important in terms of thinking about uh, about hydro or water technologies, and that's true with regard to geothermal and all of the uh, renewable resources, is that each one of these wonderful resources is a whole family of technologies and applications. And that is a really wonderful attribute that they can bring to all of us as we look at how we can transform to a cleaner, healthier economy. So now, Linda, let's talk about jobs and hydro. Oh, excuse me. Thank you, Carol. <clears throat> um, much of what Carl has said about geothermal in terms of jobs and job opportunities can also be said about hydro. And as Carol said, there is this real renaissance occurring in hydro today that creates tremendous job opportunities. Uh, the National Hydropower Association represents both conventional hydropower, pump storage, and the, also the newer technologies, the hydrokinetic technologies of ocean tidal and in-stream hydrokinetic uh, technologies. And we've just recently done a job study I'm going to talk about in a little minute, but a lot of our work in looking at job and job opportunities has looked across the gamut of all water power technologies and trying to further the growth and development of water power technologies. Before I begin and get into that job study, I'm going to ask you some questions, and I'm going to put you all to a little bit of work today. What percentage do you think that we currently generate of our electric generation today is hydro? You heard it over there earlier in, if you were in the expo, if you were paying attention. Throw out a number. 8%? Around there, 7 to 10%. Um, how much of our renewable energy is hydro? Anybody know? What did you say? Yeah, about 70, 75%. Uh, so it varies between 65 and 75%. Um, how much of the hydro generation in the United States is owned by the federal government? Testing all your hydro knowledge here. Who somebody throw out a number? 50% of our generation in the United States is hydro, uh, is federally owned hydro. So then my question to you leads up to this. Next one is, most of hydro in the U.S. is big, right? 
How much is small? Of the, this is of the non-federal generated hydro, let's say. Anybody throw a number out? This will surprise you. 71% of hydro for, uh, that's been uh, licensed by FERC is under 5 megawatts. So a large part of our hydro in the United States is very small, although most people think of Hoover Dam and Grand Coulee, but that's not the typical hydro project in the United States. So is it a Northwest technology or a Western technology? That's what a lot of people think. No, yep, you're right. It's all over the United States. That's, that's one of the larger mis misconceptions about hydro, that it is a Western, Northwestern technology. Uh, the second biggest misconception about hydro is that it's tapped out. So what would you think? How much hydro is in the United States that's actually been developed? Of what percentage do you think of hydro in the U.S. is already developed? Throw out a number. Anybody have a guess? We actually have about 400,000 megawatts of hydro technical potential. We've only developed 100,000 of it, just under 100,000. So we've only developed a fourth of our potential. We have all this growth opportunity here in the United States. So if we grow this hydro, are we talking we've got to, be able to, have to have another big dam era, right? Building big dams, that's the only way we're going to get the next three quarters of hydro left in the United States. Anybody? No, we're not talking about building new dams. In fact, um, what percentage of dams in the United States do you think has hydro on them? You'd be surprised by this number. Anybody? How much? Oh, 3%. 3% of all the dams in the United States. There's 80,000 dams in the United States, and only 3% of them have hydro on them. So the growth opportunity that we have in the hydro industry is pretty significant. And what we're talking about is not building new dams, but we're talking about building on existing facilities. And what we know now is, is that in doing that and maximizing the infrastru our infrastructure and making it more efficient and bringing more societal value to those facilities that are already there, that we can create job opportunities for our country. I've got a few more questions for you now that's relative to getting to some of the things that, job, that uh, Carla talked about and what kinds of jobs this means. Um, we're, we're looking at, let's say, a standard turbine, a three-meter hydro turbine, small hydro turbine in the United States. There's a lot of the growth opportunity isn't small. So how much steel, because we still make turbines with steel. We're not using polymers yet for steel, uh, for turbines, although we've talked about that and doing some research on that to lower their costs. So how much steel do you think is in the average three-meter turbine, small hydro turbine? Anybody venture a guess? 112 tons of steel in one turbine. So there's a lot of job opportunities, obviously, in creating steel and manufacturing steel. How many components do you think is in that same turbine? This is three meter small hydro turbine. There's 3,810 pieces to one turbine. So there's lots of job opportunities that can be created in the, in, in the manufacture of those components, the trade, obviously, of the components, the shipping, and the service industry. So there's lots of, of opportunity there. How many man days to manufacture that same turbine? 2,000 to 3,000 man days. So that's good union jobs that you can create in casting, cutting, bending, grinding, welding, balancing, painting, and they hand polish these turbines. These turbines are built for specific sites. We don't go and say, well, I'll take one of that, one of that, two of that. Each turbine is manufactured for the specific site it's going into. So there's lots of opportunity right now in the hydro area in relative to building out that technology. We have a vision at NHA to double our current contribution of hydro. So we are on a mission to actually bring another, hydro, another 100,000 megawatts of hydro to the grid. And right now there's 50,000 megawatts sitting pending before FERC. 34,000 of that's in pump storage, 11,500 in new technologies. I mentioned ocean tidal and in stream, 4,800 in conventional technologies. A lot of this is uh, small. And as I said, there's a lot of job opportunities if we move forward and build out that technology. We currently provide 300 million jobs in the hydro industry today. We've just done this Navigant study, and what we found in the manufacturing of those turbines and all the opportunities we have to grow and develop 
but we can actually create 1.4 million jobs by 2025 in the hydro industry. By building out only about 60,000 of that 100,000 that we want to do. And the way they divide up, according to this study, uh, in terms of megawatts, is looking at the uh, 60,000 megawatts, it would be 24,000 in pump storage, 13,750 in hydrokinetic, and 21,900 in conventional hydro. But what was, I think, particularly key in this Navigant study is that's, we could build the 59,000, just under 60,000 megawatts, with an accelerated RES, renewable energy standard. But if we kept the same business as usual, we would only grow uh, about 23,000 of this hydro. So, and that would break out with about 10,000 in pump storage, only 1,500 in hydrokinetic without the right policies in place, and another 11,750 in conventional hydro. So we do know that policy makes a difference and growth creates jobs. Um, the way we've looked at these jobs, this 1.4 million jobs, we looked at direct, indirect, and induced jobs. 30% of the jobs that could be created would be in the actual direct job of the development of that hydro, and that would go off from this, the gamut of permitting it and constructing it and operating it. 20% in the in indirect side, that would be the supply side, and they look generally at the generation aspect of that, you know, the, the, the uh, uh, support to, not including transmission, that project, that particular project. And then 50% of that would be in the induced area because people had jobs, they had more money in their pockets, so they had the opportunity to go out and buy more groceries and go out to dinner and go to the movies and things of that nature. So. What we also found, and which is, I think, really exciting about that study, is that the jobs that are going to be created are generally follow where manufacturing is or where um, the growth opportunities obviously are. But the great and exciting thing that we also found was is that jobs existed in every state in hydro. So some of that is because the hydro is located all over the United States. But some of this goes back to the idea of all those components and the aspects of developing these projects. Uh, one project in particular, Hastings, Minnesota, a very, very small hydrokinetic project that came online a year ago. Their specific turbine, even uh, they, they had a lot of the manufacturing done on site there in Hastings, but they used Bath Ironworks. So they were creating jobs in Oregon for a project that was going in in uh, Minnesota. So the jobs are not regionalized. Uh, they're all over the, the area. The top 10 states for job opportunities uh, in hydro is Washington State is number one, California, Pennsylvania, Oregon, Alaska, Tennessee, Hawaii, Maine, Florida, and Idaho. Those are the very, very top states, top 10 states. But the good news, as I said, is that there's opportunity in every state. We have copies of the Navigant study uh, that uh, overhead that uh, was presented at our annual conference a month or so ago here at the desk. If you are interested particularly in the job opportunities in your uh, particular states, you can go by our booth when you first walk into the expo. Uh, we have a, a PowerPoint presentation there that lists all of the states and job opportunities by states. And I would urge you to stop by and pick up the material. As I said, policy we know matters. And Carl brought this up as well, that you know, we know we can build this out, we know there's this great opportunity, but it's only gonna happen if we get a strong RES, if we keep the tax policies and extend those tax policies, if we continue to support the R&D programs, we have $50 million now in hydro water power R&D. We need certainly more of that to continue this work, uh, as well as uh, a smarter licensing scheme. Now, one of the things that's happened is there is great new and strong support for hydropower. There's a new MOU that the Department of Energy, the Department of Interior, and the um, Corps of Engineers has just signed. Part of what we're looking for is integrating the permitting process to see a lot of this growth that will occur because they're the owners of a lot of those facilities that we're going to be built on. So for those of you that are in Congress, uh, staff in Congress, we look forward to working with you to help us continue the policies to further this growth because we know that hydro can mean 
continuing to build st a strong green economy that uh, creates new jobs uh, and puts America back to work. So thank you. I've also had the pleasure of working very closely with the Business Council for Sustainable Energy for many, many years. And so we're very, very glad to be joined this afternoon by Ruth McCormick, who is a senior policy associate with the Business Council. Thanks, Carol. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today, and I could probably go on a long time, too, to talk about jobs, because I am very interested in the work that our member companies are doing, so I know that you'll give me the sign if I go on too long. What I thought I would do with the time that I have today is to talk a little bit about the Business Council for Sustainable Energy, what it is that we do, who we are, and then I'd like to spend a little bit of time profiling some of our member companies so that I can share with you a little bit about the work that they're doing and the exciting things they're doing and the job growth and economic development opportunities that they represent. And then also to talk a little bit, as other speakers have said today, how policies really do matter. The Business Council for Sustainable Energy is a broad-based business organization that covers the gamut of clean energy and energy efficiency industries. We include renewable energy companies and associations, we include natural gas, and we include energy efficiency companies and associations. I have a map that's up here on the table that shows where all of our companies have facilities around the country because we really are all over the country. And actually this doesn't even represent all the data points on the map because we do include a number of associations and if we were to include all their points it would really be all over the place. Um, but there's one here for you to pick up if you'd like. One of the things that we do as an organization, or really kind of our primary focus, is to look at policies in terms of how they deploy existing clean energy technologies. Because if we can do that, we can accomplish a lot of major policy objectives. We can reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we can create jobs, and we can become more energy independent and have more energy security. So there's a lot of really good reasons why we want to do deploy these existing clean energy technologies. So let me take a little bit of time to talk with you about the real companies that create the real jobs, the guys that wear the hard hats, who are on the ground today working to create these jobs. One of the companies that's one of our members is a company called Direct Energy. This is a company that has facilities all over the country. They are an energy service company. They have a lot of expertise in doing energy services in people's homes. Um, right now, they're facing, an, with the economic downturn, the construction industries have been very hard hit. In fact, it's probably one of the most, if not the most, the hardest hit sector in the economy with about 25% unemployment in the construction trades. So their business has been affected. Um, and they obviously are doing things to to do business and to uh, go into people's homes and do energy efficiency retrofits as well as in new housing construction. Um, they're doing work with their employees to get them certified as energy auditors, but they're finding that there's only so much that they can do and so much investment that they can make without clear policy signals and some certainty to know that their investments are going to be worthwhile. One of the things that they've been doing uh, in the city of Houston is doing a public-private public partnership where they've gone into people's homes doing kind of the cheap energy efficiency retrofits that they can do, putting in ceiling fans or putting in attic insulation, um, kind of like I said, the cheap things that they could go in and do caulking. So they find that with that public-private partnership that on average, they've been able to reduce energy consumption in homes on a weather-adjusted basis by as much as 19%. And with what they call more deep retrofits, if they were to be able to go in and change out the old HVAC systems or replace inefficient appliances, uh, they would see even greater energy efficiency savings. And the, the payback for the improvements that they've been able to make in these kind of cheap fixes has been two years. So the payback is really pretty steep. So they're finding that they're able to do a lot of really great things by saving homeowners money on their utility bills, they can create jobs, 
They can reduce peak demand for energy use um, and reduce the need for peaker plants. So there's policies that they would like to see in place that can help provide the kind of certainty that would help them to be able to do that business so that those investments that they're making can be realized. Another one of our companies is a company called Orion Energy, which is based in Wisconsin. This is kind of one of my personal favorites. I think what they do is just kind of cool because it's just really simple but makes a whole lot of sense. They make energy efficient lighting fixtures. They have this one technology called a solar light pipe that they put into mostly commercial buildings with the flat roofs that create daylight in a commercial space and then they're kind of, they can be, depending on what the facilities are like, they can be fixed to some energy efficiency lighting fixtures so that if you don't get the direct sunlight, you the artificial lights will automatically come on so that you have a constant um, light in a space. This is a company that's seen tremendous growth uh, over the last really just eight years. Back in 2002, they only had 20 employees. Um, today, they have over 240 direct employees. And then because they also do work with customers all around the country, they have about 300 uh, local contractors, sheet metal workers, that they work with to install their technologies. And of course, when they go into these places around the country, they do try to use the local workforce because those are people who are there on the ground. They know the local building codes. And so a company like this, even though it's only got a certain amount of direct employees, can really branch out and use a lot of indirect employees. But again, there's policies that need to be in place to make their technologies kind of more on a level playing field to what we we see in the market today. So policies are very important to them, things like a renewable electricity standard and making sure that their technologies are included in whatever kinds of definitions there are. Another one of our member companies is a company called Recycled Energy Development, which is a company that goes in and recycles waste heat. And one of the projects that they've been involved in that I think is one that's frequently mentioned is a silicon plant based in West Virginia. And what this company does, is the silicon plant uh, basically uses a lot of really intense hot heat to melt quartz rock in order to get the silicon. And of course, when they do that, they have a lot of excess waste heat that just goes up the stack, which can actually cause a lot of damage to pollution control equipment. It's difficult to manage. So all of this excessive heat is just being vented through their exhaust. This company, Recycled Energy Development, has gone in and they capture that waste heat and they recycle it so that they can use that waste energy to produce more electricity, which they can then sell to the grid or they can use to provide the electricity needs for the silicon plant itself. By doing that, this, this plant has been able to expand production by 20% and jobs by 20%. And so what they're finding is that by reducing their costs, by recycling their waste energy, is that their silicon that they're producing has become more competitive on the global market. And they're actually able to take jobs back from countries like China, which have been the leaders in this area. So this kind of uh, smart use of energy and energy efficiency can really help make our manufacturing sector and our industrial sector a lot more efficient and more competitive globally. But again, there's policies that need to be in place, particularly tax policies, that are important to companies like this to help them to deploy these technologies to get them into the marketplace. So with respect to some of the policies, and just by way of example on how important they can be and what kind of an impact they can be, I just want to point out a report that was recently released by the Department of Energy that was done at the request of the House Ways and Means Committee as they were looking at what kind of impact the uh, 1603 Treasury Grant Program has had on job growth and creation since the stimulus was passed last year. The Treasury Grant Program was one where companies, renewable energy companies, were able to get a grant in lieu of their tax credits because the tax equity markets really weren't functioning with the economic crisis the way they were supposed to. And so this was a short-term attempt to help these companies get the capital that they needed to install and deploy these projects. They found that with this study that over 55,000 jobs were created all across the board in all types of renewables, including wind, 
and geothermal, and that they were able to generate 4.25 gigawatts of renewable power. And I know that Carol's giving me the high sign. I will just say that there's other reports that are out there, including another Department of Energy report that looks at the job potential if we were to be able to deploy 20 percent wind energy by 2030. And the job potential there is tremendous, um, not only in the wind industry itself, but also those ancillary jobs, the attorneys, the accountants, those workers that have to provide services to the wind industry itself. So the bottom line is all those policies that really would help to create the certainty in the marketplace, the ones that have been mentioned already today, like tax policy, renewable energy standards, energy efficiency standards, comprehensive energy and climate change legislation, those can really help create that system where these companies that are really ready, primed, and ready to go can continue to generate jobs. So thank you. And I just wanted to mention, too, that we will try to have up the information that our speakers have presented to get that posted on EESI's website uh, after uh, today's forum. And, and, of course, the video will be up within uh, a few days as well. Uh, we have just a few minutes for uh, Q&A. And so if you've got any questions, um, uh, now is your chance to put together a pithy question for these people who have just given you a lot of great data, or if you've got other points that any of you wanted to make. Any questions or comments? Okay. Mm -hmm. The plant that you mentioned in um, West Virginia, the silicon plant, is that in Alloy, West Virginia? Yes. Okay. That's the same thing. Okay. Um, Can I just add to that, though, really quickly? Um, I've been in meetings recently with the folks from Recycled Energy Development, and what they're looking to do is there's other places around the country that have similar situations. In fact, there's a silicon plant in Alabama that I think that once they are finished with what they're doing in West Virginia, they would like to go to Alabama, because there's, I think, potential all around the country for these kinds of uh, recycled energy development. Okay. Uh, I think there were three hands over here, but Nina, yeah, go ahead. In terms of jobs? In terms of getting it. Um, well, I think all of us could say that transmission is always an issue with, first of all, transmission is, I think, a generic issue we face, whether you're talking about renewables or any other new power plant. Our infrastructure is fairly old. It's not terribly interactive uh, with, with distributed generation. Uh, it's fairly balkanized. Uh, California doesn't seem to like to talk to Nevada sometimes about what they're doing. And what we're seeing as we grow out, whether it's wind, solar, geothermal, I'd say all the renewables are running into one barrier, which is the transmission system needs updating, it needs upgrading, it needs expansion, it needs key interlinks. And probably just as important, we actually need a political and regulatory system that will accomplish that. So uh, that's, that's one of the problems we're facing. I mean, I, I have a staff consultant who spends virtually full time going to meetings at either state, regional, or federal level, and we often wonder how much progress is actually being made. But we in the geothermal business have, are a little bit behind the boom era that we've seen with wind and solar, but we're seeing that same acceleration. A year or two ago, very few of my companies were too worried about transmission because in part, I think there's a bit of cherry picking going on. You pick sites close to transmission. But now as we're moving down that horizon, we're seeing plants that are actually being delayed where we've got projects ready to go, drilling's already been done on them, and we're being told that the transmission part of that might be 17 years away. Um, so it, it, it is a potentially huge bottleneck. I think it's technology neutral. I think our transmission bottleneck it is affecting all technologies, and uh, it's, it's, it is something we have to deal with. I think the uh, grant program. Yeah. Well, go ahead. We'll go down the line. 
Well, I would say that our organization continues to support comprehensive energy and climate change legislation because that's what's going to generate the sustained economic growth and jobs. I mean, we can have some short-term fixes, but really for sustained growth, we think that there needs to be a comprehensive energy and climate policy. If they can't get a comprehensive climate and energy bill, I would say that the fallback would be we need to see some of the provisions, the tax provisions for grants and the, the credits in the stimulus bill extended because the tax rate program runs out after this year and our economy has still not quite picked up. People are looking at the bottom line and companies don't want to be carrying a lot of debt. And the tax grant program is particularly effective in that because in our field, most every company that received a tax grant is building more plants than they received tax grants for. And so the bottom line is that tax grant lets them buy down their debt, have a better balance sheet, lets them move forward and build more projects, and that's, that's about to expire. So I think if, if we can't get an energy bill done, and I agree, I think we all agree, Comprehensive climate energy bill is top priority, but we also know it's almost June. Appropriations bills are stacking up. Uh, I heard the tax extenders bill still needs to get done. Um, so let's at least make sure that these projects keep going and don't face a cliff because the stimulus provisions start expiring. And from, from Hydra's perspective, that's true. I agree with both my colleagues here. We would like to see a comprehensive energy and climate bill, but at a very minimum, we really do need to move forward with the, a, a strong energy piece that has the very important tax components in it. Uh, one thing I didn't mention uh, is that uh, the manufacturing that's occurring, yes, GE used to do turbines, hydro turbines as well, and they've gotten out of the hydro, hydro business. But what we are seeing is that there are new manufacturing plants being built in the United States today on hydro manufacturing and hydro manufacturing turbines. Uh, Voith is expanding its uh, facilities and building a new plant in Ohio. We have a new plant in two weeks being dedicated by Alstom in Tennessee. I have a Czech uh, manufacturer that's a member that's looking to open its uh, facility here in the U.S. and is looking at the Detroit region. So there is real opportunity here, um, but the reason they're doing it is because the tax policies are. We have that manufacturing tax credit that is so critical. So the tax component of an energy bill is critical to see this growth and keep our industries moving forward. Great, thank you. Uh, really fast, because then we're, okay, last question. Okay. My question is, the jobs buzzword right now is very popular against the region because our legislators respond to that. I, I would make the argument that we need to look further into what kind of jobs we create. I'm sure the ones that you're talking about are talking about infrastructure with our politicians. But my question is, do you sort of question this, this jobs as a focus, and, and do you try to point your uh, politicians that you deal with when they're thinking about the Senate that they're creating into looking at other metrics that might be more appropriate? Hmm. Uh, that, that, that sounded like a trick question. I, mean, <laughs> I think, first of all, in terms of jobs, we're in part responding because that's what people are seeing is the economy is down and we're saying, where do we go? I think when you look at the flip side of this, the other part of this equation was called the green economy, which is what we need to be moving into. And I think that it, it's important to see that, the, that I think the two really do go hand in hand, that we're building out power systems, but we're also building new technologies, new ways of doing things. It all really does come together. We are seeing, you know, you get the construction jobs with the hard hat, and you get the new ideas and the new technologies which uh, turn around and help become export products for this country. They become tomorrow's widgets. Um, so I, I think you really want to sell the whole picture because I think that's what we want to see done. And to go back to, to, to uh, Linda's point, I mean, there was a lot of concern in Congress about manufacturing, you know, where were things built. And the bottom line is things are going to be built where the market is. And one of the biggest problems we face is the U.S. market has been starts and stops and starts and stops and more stops than starts. And since I've been doing energy business, uh, every two years we seem to have fixed the energy problem and walk away from it. And we've gotten one of the most incredible boosts in the last couple of years for all these technologies. We really have seen a sustained period of growth over several years. The people who are today looking at things like manufacturing plants aren't on an 18-month horizon. The people who are looking today at investing in major investment in new, not just, not just an old style, but a new technology facility also aren't on 18 months horizon. So that's why I think our first choice will be a long-term energy bill and ex extension, continued push for what we're doing, 
because that's what's going to bring everything else with it, not just the quick hit for the construction jobs, but the long-term transition. And frankly, I'd like to see our country be the technological leader in these areas. We're the fastest, we're the largest geothermal producer. I would say arguably we're still the technology leader, but I, I also worked with the wind industry and solar industry, and I don't, I think partly our policy fits and starts to fade into the fact that we aren't that in many of these areas anymore. So let's make the transition, let's lead in doing that, let's build a range of new jobs. Uh, I think that's what the ideal we'd all like to see. I'd like to thank our panel very, very much. And obviously it's really key that, as, as your question indicated, that the thing is that with regard to all of these technologies and these renewable resources, that they accomplish multiple things all at the same time. As we look at what our future should be, Right now, Congress is very, very concerned about what's happening in their districts with regard to high unemployment and what that means for the future. This is one way where, again, we're able to accomplish multiple things at the same time, and one of those things is jobs. So thank you very, very much, and I'd like to ask our next panel to come forward. Thanks. <laughs>